hide that. It's recording me now. And I think that's all I need to show at the moment. And I've got slides here. So I'm going to start presenting. And let's say enable presenter view. I don't know what that is. I thought that was going to be over there. Excuse me. So let me start that. And I do it a little differently than you're supposed to in this program. OK, here we are. So welcome back, uh, or welcome if you're new to St. Mary's. And in particular, welcome to uh, the Sobe School that uh, I always view it as a, actually a privilege to have you here. You get to choose uh, what university, what programs you go to. Uh, if you've chosen the business program at St. Mary's, you don't necessarily get to choose your courses, you choose your sections, um, but you've chosen to be here in uh, whatever way you've made that choice, and I appreciate it. And I understand already that you can hear me, and as I've mentioned to some of you, that uh, there's this chat window, and that's, you keep, uh, it's always visible to me, the way I've, I'll keep my screen, is such that I can always see what's happening in the chat. And uh, you can ask anything as we go through, even if it's not directly related to what's going on. And uh, I'll often stop what I'm doing to respond to that. And uh, that, uh, but it, it, it also tells me you're still there. <laughs> I don't know if everybody's walked out of the room. Uh, this is a strange world for me, and it may be for you as well, um, but uh, I enjoy teaching in a classroom, but this online stuff is, mm, although we did it all last term, it, it's still something I'm getting used to. That uh, The chat is, uh, all of this stuff is recorded, and the chat stays there forever, even after class, and it's a communication platform. I think it's run by Top Hat, but anyway, it's linked into Top Hat, and you've got a uh, Slate account. You probably got notice of that. Uh, you should be able to access it on your phone. You should be able to access all of Top Hat on your phone. Um, that uh, you're more familiar with a lot of technology than I am. If you run into technical issues with Top Hat, then they have their own support line, and you can contact them through that. Uh, but other things, you email me, and uh, I'm generally pretty quick at getting back to people. I was emailing back and forth with a student uh, up until just two minutes before the class this morning. Uh, she was curious about how to see things. Anyway, so uh, hmm, I don't have a printed copy of my slide, so I'm trying to remember what I've got lined up here. But uh, this is sometimes slow. But right now, I'd like a little bit of information from you to get us started. That I want to know where you are. Are you in Halifax? Uh, that uh, are you somewhere within the region? Are you in another country? So I'm going to start the question here. And you should be, I know you're giving me through the chat, but hey, come on. That, somewhere, there it is. Whoops. Ah, it didn't work. Somehow I messed it up that uh, within this program, I should have been able to flash this out. I, it's as I suspected, most of you are local. Ah, someone's in Turkey. Good. That I'm curious about those that aren't here. Um, if I'd done this properly, that uh, I would have given you a minute or so to respond. And then we would have gotten a little picture, a graph. Oh, you're in Dubai. And it would have told us what percentage of students are in Halifax, uh, what percentage are in Atlantic Canada, who's elsewhere in, in uh, Mauritius. Oh, wow. You're, you're uh, out. What time is it in Mauritius right now? It should be like uh, you're ahead of us. What is it, early afternoon? And the, uh, for those in Halifax that don't know Mauritius, it's, it's a set of islands that are 
in the Indian Ocean, sort of off of Africa and what a little bit west of India. Ah, 438. Okay. Um, great students come from Mauritius. Anyway, um, this course is radically different, not just because it's online, but it's radically different uh, from what it was just a few years ago. As you can see, I'm pretty old. I'll tell you about myself. Well, I'm medical. I'll tell you about myself and the course at the same time. So there's a little video posted on Top Hat that tells you a little bit about who I am. Uh, I've been at uh, St. Mary's for over 40 years. Uh, that they, uh, I don't think there's anybody, there's definitely nobody in the business school that is teaching today that was teaching when I started teaching. And uh, I came here uh, to teach courses such as this one. My background is in mathematics and this field which when I took it in the 1970s was a very new field called management science. Uh, I was taking it at uh, the University of Waterloo and it was the first such program in officially as management science uh, that in Canada, uh, there were a couple programs in, it was in an engineering school and in many engineering schools, they would have called it industrial engineering back then. Uh, I'm not an engineer. Anyway, uh, that, uh, and my roots are, I grew up in Montreal, but when I started university, uh, my family moved, my parents moved to Nova Scotia, and I went to University of New Brunswick. So I view myself as I'm, though I'm come from away, uh, my family has been in Nova Scotia now for 50 years. Uh, and my wife's family has been in uh, Lunenburg County for since 1750 whatever she's uh one of her she traces her roots back to the original settlers in in uh, uh the lunenburg county area the german settlers and so anyway and that's who where i came from and i came to saint mary's a good number of years back to teach this sort of course and uh, along the way I, my path changed uh, several times. Uh, in the early 1990s, I became Dean of the Business School. You know, uh, not having any business background or having taken any business courses, that was a little surprising. But uh, So I was Dean for about eight years, got to build the Sobe building and do a bunch of interesting things, went back to teaching uh, and I wasn't back teaching very long and I got drafted into a new job they had created, or we were creating, uh, an associate vice president of enrollment. And I oversaw admissions, student recruitment as the registrar, uh, student accounts, financial aid, uh, a lot of the services, the, the back-end business portion of the university uh, came under me. And I ran that for a dozen years. And then four years ago, I said, I want to go back to teaching full-time. So over the 40 years, I've taught almost every single year, and I've taught at least one course. Uh, but uh, in terms of full-time teaching, half my career has been in administration, half of it has been full-time teaching. So four years ago, I came back full-time teaching, and I looked at our quants courses. Quant 1, if you took that last term, and I think a lot of you did, uh, that you probably used a textbook that... Uh, about six chapters or so. That was one I'd, I'd rewritten the course 15 years ago and that to fit the way I wanted the course to be, I wrote the text that went with it. And so that's probably what you used last semester. But it hasn't changed much in those 15 years. It needs a bit of a, an overhaul. Uh, but 1206, it hadn't changed at all in 25 years. They were using problems I'd created in the early 90s that uh, and it needed a lot of work. The course officially is, um, you didn't use a text. Okay, that the, uh, uh, it, it varies as to what they're using. Most of it's based upon a text I wrote 15 years ago. Anyway, the, uh, and, but 1206, it was still primarily a calculus course, and that's traditional in business schools in 
so many universities have programs that require calculus. They never use it, but they require it because they've always done that. And uh, that, uh, but if it's going to be a required course in your program, it's got to add value to you. We should be in the business of adding value to you. That's what the institution is trying to do or should be trying to do. And I didn't think it was. So I refashioned the course. And what you're getting is uh, an introduction more to data because our world today, its foundation is data. Everything we do is about data. And that's what your course is about at a very, in some respects, a very elementary level. But we're going to be looking at topics that many students, if had covered in a course, would be covered in a third or fourth year course. They'd be very, some would criticize what I've thrown into the class as being too advanced. No, the students are able to manage this stuff very well. Um, don't underestimate your intelligence at all. And I think we had a very successful term last term. It's a very practical course. That this is stuff that I expect you to go out and use, or at least the ideas and the ways of thinking you're going to be able to use uh, in your courses, future courses, in the way you think about them, and definitely in the business world. Businesses are, are desperately asking for this. The accounting profession has asked that all um, uh, people that want to become an accountant have a course that's comparable to what's being covered here. But in fact, today, I don't know of a university in Canada that's teaching this stuff yet. So you're at the leading edge. And I hope you enjoy this. The, uh, the students last term, I think, did. So uh, a few other bits. Uh, I'll probably start every day with some pictures. This, uh, and usually it's a picture taken that morning, and I'll tell you about how those come about. Uh, at the moment, I'm staying at a cottage we built to, just a little over a year ago and it was always wanted a cottage and uh, but never had the money or worried about this that the other thing and then when I hit 65 decided I wasn't going to retire so why not take out a loan build a cottage enjoy it sell it if we need the money or whatever and so we've built a cottage in Kingsburg, Nova Scotia. That's where my wife was born and spent her uh, early years anyway. And uh, we're way up on a hill. We don't have ocean frontage, but we're way up on a hill that overlooks the ocean. And this is yesterday morning looking out at Kingsburg Bay. Um, if you don't know where Kingsburg is, if you've heard of Hurdles Beach and Gaff Point, you've got to go through Kingsburg to get there, uh, or you're right next to it. And, uh, Google it and look it up, but you'll see a few, a few pictures of it as we go through. But this was yesterday morning. It's a similar this morning, very stormy out there. And uh, normally in the morning, we'll, at this time of year, we'd have five or six lobster boats out there. But with this type of weather, um, uh, you're not seeing anything on my screen. It should be shared. Are you? Okay. All right. You should be able to see my screen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, but you can see with the rough weather, uh, this is uh, the boats aren't out there. At nighttime, we see lights from tuna boats that are out there fishing. And again, with the rough seas, they haven't been out there. Fishing is a very rough life. Um, but now, normally when you're out, and the reason I'm out early in the morning is Dora. Dora takes me for a walk each morning. And so my day starts early uh, because I've got to take, go out with Dora. <laughs> um, that uh, this is Dora here. Uh, Dora came into our life in the spring. Between Dora and the cottage, that's how I've so far gotten through COVID. That there, there are two real joys in my life. And they're a very calming, soothing influence on things. Uh, COVID has been a challenging time. Dora is with me at the moment. She's on the floor curled up. But some days you may see during in my little screen here, uh, a couple little ears sticking up because she likes to sit on my lap during class. And when I'm at home with class, and probably next week I'll be at home in Halifax, that uh, 
Sam or uh, Bruce there on the right, uh, they like to climb up on the table that I use as my desk because it's got a window in front of it. And they like to go and look out the window. So you may see them come and crawl across my keyboard and, and join in. But most of the time they do what Sam's doing now, sleeping. Uh, but so I'll, I'll generally show these sorts of things. Start a class, it gets us warmed up. It's well, people are, are coming into class in the morning to get us started. Uh, but uh, if you've got pictures of your neighborhood, of your favorite animal, your favorite person, maybe, a uh, place you like to go, something that's special to you, uh, I'd ask you to share it with me, email it to me. I'll use your pictures at the start of my class uh, that I didn't get many last term, but I'd love to see ones from Mauritius or from Turkey or uh, Dubai, uh, anywhere else you happen to be. Uh, and share them with the class that um, show where you're from or what's special to you. So although we can't be in a classroom and see one another in that regard, um, it, I, the students did, at the end of the term, we did a survey. And part of their feedback was they liked the sort of personal nature and trying to form relationships in some, whatever way we can through this thing. So anyway, let's run through the course outline. The course, um, when I was starting to revise and rebuild this course last spring, uh, anticipating that we would be online in the fall, and I was expecting that back in April, I started trying to seek out assistance in how to design and build a good online course. And I had trouble getting such assistance within the university. And uh, I was in conversation with a firm called Top Hat which is a Canadian firm. I think they're in Waterloo. And most of its business is in the US, but it uh, operates similar to Brightspace, but really it's uh, intended to be both a virtual and an in-class classroom-based learning environment. Uh, they started their business uh, adding clickers to courses so that students could interact using their phone or a clicking device. Uh, but they were looking for digital content uh, to create. They wanted to be a publisher, like a book publisher, as well as a platform for learning management. And we got talking and uh, ended up moving the course into the top app environment. And they led me along and gave me a lot of advice on how to build the course and how to deal with things. And they've given me continuous support since. So um, that's in large measure, the, the textbook, the way it's been built, I can't deliver in Brightspace. So that's why it's structured in this sort of fashion here. So the textbook has been split into 12 chapters corresponding to 12 weeks. And uh, that uh, students told me that they didn't like seeing too much information at once. And so I'll release it about a week at a time and uh, in advance. But you'll find by the end of the course that your Top Hat uh, site is going to be populated with a huge amount of stuff. But we'll just slowly roll that out so it doesn't look too scary at first. And within each chapter, there are 10 multiple choice questions. So as you read a chunk, you'll see a question, then you read another chunk, and there may be several questions. And so it's to help test you on did you understand the material? Or not. Uh, it's a way of trying to encourage you to learn. Uh, and these quizzes, these are the quizzes that we have within the course, are embedded within the chapter. They're not just a self-contained quiz start here, end here. It's, it's spread through the whole chapter. And it's very different from uh, quizzes you may have done before. Uh, we've set it up, and this is Top Hat's idea, that the uh, each question if you get the wrong answer, it tells you, no, incorrect. Try again. Yeah, you get a second attempt. And you don't have to try right away. It's open book. You could, hmm, I thought it was B was the right answer. Let me go back, read some material, and then I'll make the decision. Last term, I even had the odd student that would send me an email. I thought it was B. This was Y. But it says I'm wrong. Why? 
and we get into a conversation about that question, then they go back and answer and get their right answer. Uh, so you get two tries. And even if both are wrong, you still get half a point at the moment because the grading we've got can be structured for some points for participation and some points for correctness. That, uh, yeah, they're the pop-up questions that you'll see as you go through. And you should find that there are 10 of them. And so you should be able to see that you've got 10 completed. And I think it should be telling you what your score is out of 10, um, somewhere to do with the chapter. Maybe it's at the beginning or something. I don't know how it appears on your end versus mine. And uh, you can do it at any time. Uh, you can do a couple of questions one day, a couple of questions another day. But come midnight, and for this first one, for chapter one, it's going to be Saturday night, this coming Saturday, the, the 9th of January, at midnight. The quiz, you won't be able to answer questions after that. You've still got the chapter available to you, but the quiz portion of it, those questions, all get turned off at midnight. And each week, that's going to happen. Every Saturday night, it gets turned off. But you can do the quiz anytime you feel like it. I'll post uh, chapter two uh, later today or tomorrow and so you can go and do the quiz for chapter two uh, anytime you want as well but you'll have to have it finished by the 16th and i'm going to pick the best 10 out of those 12. so you can figure what the grades looked like last term students that did the quizzes and some students were lazy and didn't but if you do you're almost guaranteed a total of 20 points almost every the average grade was between 18 and 20 uh, for the quiz portion of the course uh, it's, it's an incentive, a carrot out there for you to read the chapter and reflect on, upon the chapter. Not just read it, but actually think about it a little bit. And you'll notice that you're being tested on it before I've covered it all in the classroom. I'll cover half of it in one class, and then the other half I cover after the quiz is done. And actually, uh, I'm going to cover most of it on Monday's class of chapter one. Then we have a test, which is more formal, uh, but it's really not too bad either. It's every two weeks we do a test that is like taking two sets of quiz questions, about 20 multiple choice questions, and give you an hour to go and answer them. So they look like the quiz questions, exactly same format, same sort of material. Uh, but now you've only got 60 minutes to do it. Still open book, but within 60 minutes, it's hard to go back. And it only covers two chapters. So when we get up to test number three, it'll be on chapters five and six. Test four will be on seven and eight. Uh, test five on nine and 10. Chapters 11 and 12, you won't have a test on. Um, that the course is pretty much over then. Um, I'll do a practice test next week. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, next week I'll run it, just to make sure you can use the technology. Um, the test opens up at 1 in the morning, uh, Halifax time, closes at 11 o'clock. Once you start it, you've got 60 minutes to finish. Um, typically, um, last term I was using about 18 to 20. Uh, I may only have 16 questions. They're worth eight points each. Uh, so 16 questions makes it easy math working out what your score would be. And uh, students did not do all that well on the test, not nearly as well as on the quizzes. The quizzes, they got near perfect scores. Uh, the tests, much lower scores. That uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, multiple choice isn't necessarily easy. It's not the, my favorite way of testing. But it works well, especially in an online environment. Um, so there's no midterm, no final exam. So these tests and quizzes are the only exams of sorts that you're going to go through. And so uh, at the end of the term, you don't have to worry about the final. Um, we're, we're at last class. We're, we're all done. Nothing left. Um, it had been suggested that we have discussions. and just trying to get you engaged in some fashion. I've 
found that hard to do in the live class other than through the chat um, that we've tried it last term, but it didn't work all that well. And so uh, each week I'm going to pose a discussion question. I'm not sure when I'm going to turn it off. I'll leave it open probably for several weeks at least. And that it'll be on a topic that is of a very broad general nature, it, uh, but relates to the course material. So the first chapter is about what is data analytics and what's, uh, why is it important, what's going on here. And the first discussion question is getting you to think about uh, how has it affected you? Because it has. That data is being captured about you all the time and it's being used by firms to go and influence you. Think of when you're online and those ads pop up. And um, I keep seeing ads for St. Mary's on a number of sites. Well, why? Um, that I'm not telling, I can go on a site I've never been on before and I see an ad for St. Mary's, how'd that happen? Well, they figured out that I'm probably connected with the university or education might be relevant to me and that sort of thing, and they're targeting ads for it. But there are a lot of ads that get posted that are even more specific, that they know about what I buy online, what I'm interested, what websites I've seen. Uh, they're really targeting those things and they're trying to influence me in some fashion. And it's, it's become very extreme. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, which is a business networking site, it's always suggesting uh, people that I might be interested in having joined my network, people I don't know, but I might have something in common with. Again, trying to influence me. Data analytics does that. I'm, so I'd like you to start reflecting upon how it may have happened to you. And it may be that you don't recognize it at first, but after the next week or two, you, you may start realizing it's happening all around you. Uh, and each week I'll be trying to pose a question that's more a reflective one about your own personal opinions or um, experience with something. And the, per the objective is reflection. You'll understand the topics better if you personally reflect upon them. And I can't, grade your answers as being good answers or bad answers. There's no good or bad answers. Uh, there's just what your thoughts are. And so I'll grade you on participation. And so we'll just start chalking up that participation. And if your discussion score is better than your worst test score, I'll replace that test score with the discussion score. So again, an incentive for you to participate. That participation will actually help you learn the material better. I'm more interested in you learning than I am at uh, uh, doing assessment and focusing in on grades. Uh, it's not a priority with me. And that uh, assignments though, I need you to practice some of the material. This is a very heavy Excel course. Uh, I don't assume that you've taken Excel before. You, I don't assume you've taken an intro computers course. So. I'll be showing you along the way how to do these things. But Excel is found in every workplace and I'll be showing you how you can use very basic tools in Excel to get insights about data. And Excel is not the software used by professionals doing data analytics. But I don't know if you'll necessarily be one of those professionals doing data analytics, but you will be um, working in a business environment or in some type of organization and that organization will have Excel. And that'll be their common tool for managing simple information. But we'll get to it, you'll see, don't worry. And last year we did a project in the course. This time I'm not, it, it ended up becoming a nightmare for students. I think they learned a lot, but the group work didn't work. So we're not gonna do that, but I'm gonna to try to replicate some of the things that students did within projects. And part of it involved collecting some data and having you analyze the data. Um, oh, Mia, yes. The I've not made the discussion anonymous. It's gonna show your name as Mia, 
and it's going to show what you said. Uh, so don't think say things that are <clears throat> impolite, uh, but you can say things that are controversial. You can poke at your classmates. Uh, those don't be offensive. And but everybody can see everything, so you can see what others said. Um, and it may it's I'd like you to look at what other people have to say, and look at the different opinions that are there. That's that it isn't a discussion if you can't see uh, the posts of other people. But we're going to do a survey. I'm going to put out the call for that survey at the end of this week. We'll run it for about 10 days or so. Uh, last year, we got about 350 students to respond. Told me a lot about who they were and different information about them. And we're going to repeat the same survey with you, with all the different sections of the course. And I'm going to merge the two data sets. Last fall, we did that and we used it in class and for assignments. And we looked at how COVID has affected um, the students, has affected the makeup of the course, of who's enrolled and who isn't. Uh, we found that enrollment of uh, women and of international students dropped off. We found that student summer earnings dropped a fair bit uh, last summer compared to previous summers, especially among international students. We found stress and depression levels jump quite significantly, um, as yeah, we all experienced that. But we had the data to support it; it's just not opinion. And so we can explore how it may have changed your environment, and uh, you can find out more about about your classmates and about things. Uh, those of you taking it this term are very different from the students that took it last term. Just looking at your names, the class list, that's data. I can get insights about you. Most of those names are Anglo-Saxon, sort of British type ones, or French, or German, uh, old Nova Scotia families. So immediately I knew most of the students probably uh, went to school in Nova Scotia. That uh, Not that many international students in terms of the names that didn't fit that profile people that had moved here don't have long histories in this province. Whereas in the fall, um, uh, many more international students. In the fall, I get a, a huge number of transfer students, a lot older students. I expect most of you are relatively new high school graduates. Um, but I can pick up that very quickly just by looking at a little bit of information that's there and start getting an understanding. If I'm looking at the data and I'm using that to inform how I'm going to teach. So the way I teach the class in the fall, somewhat different from how I teach you in the winter. But still, you're probably a fairly diverse group. The fall term students, they're incredibly diverse. So it's um, it's fun to teach. It's also challenging. Um, what I want to do today, though, is just walk through what is data analytics um, and what I'd expect you to know. And we're going to go through one example of that. Hopefully, it'll work for us. So explaining, trying to, what this is all about. The last 20 years in, in particular, 20 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But our, the ability we have to collect, store, um, process vast amounts of data is hugely different than not that long ago. That uh, most internet type activities, uh, we really, browsers you know, and, and doing stuff on the web and the like, it only started really in the mid-1990s. First online types of courses was in the late 1990s. That's just a little over 20 years ago. Before that, no, it didn't happen. Um, we didn't have the technology that uh, to download a picture. <laughs> took several minutes for a very small picture um, that uh, in the 80s, which is a little bit further back, I bought one of the first hard disks on campus. Oh, is my audio not working? Am I quiet? Okay, you can hear. Um, if you can't, try refreshing your screen. That seemed to work last term with some students that it seemed to drop it. 
Uh, but in, in the 1980s, I probably had the very first hard disk on campus for a computer. It cost me $5,000. Now, that's over 30 years ago. You can imagine what $5,000 would be today. I bought the biggest I could get, 10 megabytes. That was massive. <laughs> um, that we thought, how would I ever use 10 megabytes of data? Uh, your phone probably takes pictures that are bigger than 10 megs. But uh, it's changed very quickly. And because of this, we're capturing it all. Everything we're doing is generating a huge amount of data. This class is generating a huge amount of data that's being, um, all the activities, so much of it's being stored. Can you imagine how much data, uh, you know, Facebook, is storing. Everything you do is being captured all the time for all the users. It's it's massive amount. And even data that isn't traceable directly to you, we call it metadata, um, it tells us about things that, uh, so uh, early days with Google when advertising, when we were doing recruitment campaigns and online marketing of our programs, which was relatively new when we started doing it in 2006, 2007. And we'd use Google Analytics. It captured metadata. It captured the IP address of the person that was viewing our website. And so we knew where they were. So I could find out who visited the St. Mary's website. Uh, how many from Mauritius? How often do they do it? How long did they stay on the site? Um, where did they go afterwards? Whole bunch of those things I didn't know about who the person was, but I knew a lot, an awful lot about what was going on there. And uh, social media has just made this stuff explode even more. So, since so many of you are in Halifax, uh, a lot of you probably go to Tim Hortons, or at least you used to, and you may well have downloaded the Tim Hortons app during the spring. That was a new app they had, so you could order your coffee in advance. Uh, and it'll be there fresh, ready for pickup. That app uses your uh, location, the GPS information on your phone. And so it knows whereabouts you are and how long maybe it'll take you to get to that local Tim Hortons to pick up your coffee. Okay. Did you know that it's picking up your location information? I think it's every 15 minutes or maybe or more often than that, all the time. All the time your phone is on, it's tracking where you are. So if you go to a Starbucks to get a coffee, they know. They know who's visiting their competitors because they know the location of the Starbucks. And if your phone's location is the same as the Starbucks location, then you're probably at Starbucks. That uh, it will track What's your location generally at night? That's probably where you live. So they know where you live. Um, what's your location during the day for most of the day? Ah, they know where you work, at least the building you're in. They may not know who you work for if there are multiple firms in that building, but uh, they know where you go all the time. They know when you go on vacation uh, that they can track those people that are not staying in their bubble for COVID if they wanted to. It's just scary. It really is. But they can use that. They, they don't know how to use that data at the moment. But it's scary that they're collecting it and they're saving it. So, um, so this term data analytics, some people call it data science. Uh, some view it as data mining. Uh, there are a variety of different labels. Nothing has been settled yet as to what to call it. So we've got a lot. The definition I like is one that actually predates the name data analytics. It had to do with uh, knowledge discovery through data. KDD, I think it was abbreviation. And they viewed it as a process. So it's not a tool, it's a, it's a way of thinking about things, a process that we go through. And it's not trivial. Non-trivial means it's not simple. 
it's there it's it's uh, there's some work that's going to have to be done but it is a process there's steps there's a beginning and there's an end possibly but what we want to identify are things that are valid that are true uh, that are hopefully new things that you didn't know before ideally we want something that's oops uh, again another typo potentially useful uh, we don't necessarily know yet uh, we may discover something and at the moment we don't find it useful but down the road we find it is useful we'd like it to be understandable because what we discover we're probably going to need others to go and use or to believe us and so we need to be able to explain how we did it but these are all patterns that we're searching so how things that are in common or linked together or something and generally it's stored in a structured database in some formal spreadsheet or a linkage among spreadsheets in a database if you understand what a database is but it's just a, a place where the data is stored and it's organized and sometimes we have to go and scrape data and pull it together and add structure and put it in a database and we that's actually what some do they they say they scrape things off the web. They go searching for stuff, pull it together and structure it. Then you can analyze it. Uh, that, so at the end of the course, what I really want you to be able to understand is what that process is or one of the processes. So the course is structured based upon uh, how do you start a project? What should you do next? What should you do next? What should you do next? And then how do you finish it? And maybe you have to, and at what stages might you have to go backwards? And we, some of them, that uh, I'd like you to be aware of common applications of data mining. So if you did quant one, you did linear programming and you had to formulate a bunch of problems at different times. And you are introduced to the product mix problem, to the employee scheduling problem, to the transportation problem, a variety of the different classic ones. So that when, if you are given a new problem to do, you'd look at it and like, where do I start? How do I build a model or something around this problem? How do I solve it? If you started out and recognized, oh, this is a transportation problem. This is how we approach transportation problems. It makes it a lot easier. But if it was something totally new you'd never seen before, that's a lot harder to get started. So if you are aware of a number of the most common applications, it gives you ideas, oh, for value estimation problems, you usually start doing this, or this is the type of tool we'd use. But if it was a classification problem, maybe you'd be using these sorts of tools, or if it's a profiling problem, we'd use Take this sort of approach. So uh, the main thing I want is you to be just aware, not that you could necessarily solve any of those problems. I'd like you to be able to use Excel effectively for data exploration that um, most people can't. That uh, I got frustrated with my recruiters because I'd give them a spreadsheet of all applicants as of January 6th that uh, to uh, 2020 or 2021 and these were of all applicants for next September and the, the spreadsheet would tell them what high school they went to is their application complete have we accepted them or not have we offered them a scholarship a whole bunch of pieces of information about them and in May the spreadsheet would add in have they registered yet are they into classes those types of things and I was expecting them to be able to go and start mining those things. And say, hey, for Sir John A. Macdonald High School, our numbers are a lot less than last year. What's going on here? Maybe I should talk to the guidance counselor there. Or in the spring, that, hey, these students here haven't registered yet. Maybe I should contact those specific students. So I wanted them to use their time effectively to look at that, that data that they had there and explore it and see where are opportunities to improve their recruitment. Uh, they never like doing that. But if you're in sales, that's what you have to be doing all the time, exploring that data about your customers to, so that you use your time very, very effectively. If you're an accountant, 
you're going to be doing it looking for things that look strange so that maybe there's fraud taking place because you're just exploring patterns that might be there. There are a lot of challenges, though, uh, with data and with data quality. Um, I don't know if you've been following the uh, election <laughs> uh, that sort of took place yesterday in Georgia and everything that's been leading up to that and the election back, back in November. But there's questions about votes that are keep being raised and Donald Trump keeps insisting fraudulent votes and that sort of, he's questioning data quality. Should we believe that vote was a real vote? Um, is there missing data? Uh, have they hidden some of it? If I'd done that survey properly at the beginning of class today about where you are, uh, would it tell me about the class? Hmm, yes, but I'll have a whole bunch of missing observations. There's still a quarter of the class that hasn't registered for Top Hat. And when I turned on the live classroom, there were only 30, a little less than 30 of you sitting out there. So I wouldn't have had data on those that aren't here. Now, a bunch of you responded through chat and told me that. But that's still only those of you that responded. What about those that didn't respond? Can I generalize to everybody? And did you all tell me the truth? Or were you having fun with me? You know, oh, I'm going to say I'm from wherever. Make it up. I'm in Antarctica right now. I'm visiting with some penguins. I, it's, I don't know. I'd like you to have some idea about some of the methodologies. There are about 10 classic applications of data mining. Different people count them different ways. Two of the biggest are value estimation, classification. We're going to look at the methodologies for those two. We won't look at the methods for the others. And even within them, we're only actively going to be working with value estimation and using one tool for that one in a lot of depth. So I want you to have some exposure to some of the methods that are used at a high level. And I'd like at least one of those methods to get into something fairly deep so that you have a better sense of how it's used. So a little bit of balance. Uh, but I'm not trying to make technical specialists out of you. Okay. So what's this about? So if uh, you've already played this video, great. If you haven't, hopefully this works. Hello. This is on YouTube.
So hopefully you saw the video. Did it work? <laughs> uh, last term when I tried playing it, it didn't seem to work with our live class. That uh, variety of you are typing. No audio. Ooh. Okay, I don't know how to fix that then. My audio is really loud. Um, okay, it's uh, it's in the text, and you should be able to play it there. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. That uh, also in the text, it gives you a link. Uh, you couldn't hear it. Ah, that's unfortunate. So I'm going to go and tell you what the story is. The full story is quite long. Uh, there's a link in the text to New York Times Magazine where it was first published in 2012. So eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, the article was published. And the story is basically in 2002, so almost 20 years ago, two guys in marketing at Target department stores. Target, uh, it doesn't have a presence in Canada anymore. It, it wasn't successful. But Target is like Walmart. If you're unfamiliar with it. And these two guys in marketing went to see a fellow, oh, I can't think of his name now. Last name, I think, was Poole. Uh, but he was the head statistician for Target. And he managed their data. And he was, um, uh, they asked him, could you tell us which of our customers are pregnant? And if you can, can you tell us when the baby is due? Like, oh, how do you figure that out? And uh, the statistician, he said, no, leave this with me. Let me do some looking. And Target, uh, like many large firms, that has what they call a baby registry. So if you're pregnant and expecting a child uh, and you're a customer, a regular customer at a certain store, you may set up an account there, um, a baby registry. So your friends can go and say, well, I'd you know, like to buy something to help you out when the new baby comes. That what do you need? You know, do you need uh, uh, some, you know, is it baby clothes? Is it going to be for a boy or for a girl? Is it that you need uh, pampers? Is it, do you think you're going to need uh, one thing or another? And you may even put, you know, maybe they can contribute towards buying a crib or a car seat, and some really expensive products. So what they did is they looked at who had signed up for the baby registry in the past. So looking back, maybe over the last 10 years. And then looking at all of the shopping data they had about that customer, because that customer probably used their target card when they shopped so they could get points, like you might use an Air Miles card or a, uh, an Optimum card or those types of things, loyalty cards, or your Tim Hortons card. And so they knew what this person bought and when they bought it. And they looked at the pattern of shopping behavior. And then because the person had signed up for the baby registry, they knew when that person became pregnant and when the baby was due. And they watched how did the pattern of shopping change over time? And if they could extract that, and it turned out, yeah, they found 25 products. Shopping behavior changed quite dramatically with how much they bought and what types they bought, those types of things. And those were indicators. They were lotions, vitamins, those sorts of things. Uh, those were good indicators that the customer was likely pregnant. And so then they looked in their existing database of customers, and they looked who fits that profile. Those people are likely pregnant. And then based upon the pattern of shopping, they could actually predict when the baby was likely due. Scary, really scary. And that's how this story starts out in telling the story. They knew a young girl, um, yes, I always post my slides and I'll post a recording of the lecture after class that that uh, they knew when a young girl was pregnant before her family knew she was pregnant. And uh, 
those things become scary. But that's what data mining is, is that sort of process of doing those sorts of things. And oops, come on. Now my PowerPoint seems to be frozen. Did this to me last term too. All right. So we're going to cheat and, whoop, there we go. Uh, now it's jumped ahead too many slides. Okay. So we're going to be working through situations as we sort of, we're going to do the course in chunks. And the first stage in our problem solving process is trying to identify what is the problem. And you might think, well, marketing wanted to just sell more, get customers to buy more. That that's sort of their broad general business problem. In this case, they narrowed it down to, I want to change the behavior of new fam of, of, of families that are expecting a child. It's a, a good time in terms of their openness to change because they have to change because their family is changing. So that is sort of their business problem. From that, they then, what is the data analytics problem? Well, they were two questions. Which of our customers are pregnant? And when is the baby due? So it's a more specific in that regard. That that's sort of our data analytics thing. But we've got to think about okay, um, but what do we give the client at the end? What do the marketing people want? And if you think about it, what they really want is a list. Give me a list of names. Who to contact? That of ones of customers that are likely pregnant. And then we'll take it from there in terms of devising our marketing campaign. So the deliverable, and that you've got to think about what is it you're giving? Are you giving them a formula? Are you giving them what? Um, the deliverable actually, though, is not just going to be one list. They're going to probably want uh, every week a new list of new ones that have come up that you want to add because um, it's not a one-time thing. So my deliverable might also be a what's the platform they're going to be using for giving me that list and that sort of thing. So you've got to think about implementation, how you're going to use this going forward. It Most data analytics problems are not done once. They're, they have a life that takes on afterwards, and you have to think about that aspect of implementation. You need to be thinking about measuring success. Uh, you're going to give a list. Uh, Suppose the list only had 10 names on it. That's no help to me. I, but if the list had 10,000 names on it, then they'd say, hey, that's good. I've got 10,000 potential customers to chase after. So uh, success might be this measured in how many customers they're able to identify. But what if you're they can't predict perfectly. What if many of the names on the list really weren't pregnant? Is that going to be a problem? What if you miss a large proportion of your of the pregnant customers? Is that a problem? Is that good, bad? So we've got to think about success measures. So in anything that we're doing, we're going to ask how good an answer it is. But, uh, and you probably need to be thinking about the business action. How are they going to use that information? To give you an example, when I was registrar, I was asked about us building a model to predict who of you, among first-year students, who is likely to graduate eventually, and who isn't, who's likely to drop out. And I worked with a firm in the U.S., and we worked for quite a long time, but their technique that they were using, their data mining technique, they wouldn't disclose uh, there were some data privacy issues. It was a variety of things. In the end, um, felt that the relationship was not something that was going to be sustainable. And we broke apart. But as I was asked still, can't you do the prediction? And we worked at it for a little while, trying to come up with something simple because we didn't have a lot of the very fancy tools. 
and we came up with a simple tool for um, uh, it's a classification problem are you going to graduate or you're not going to graduate and we our method ended up being sort of like what's called a discriminant function like a boundary if you're in if you're on this side of the fence you're going to graduate if you're on the other side of the fence you're not going to graduate now it wasn't perfect in the predictions but we were able to discriminate we had two different ways we could do it um, both seem to work equally well and it basically said if you're on this side of the fence at Christmas so we'd measure you right now if you're on this side of the fence your chance of graduating is only 30 percent why don't you just drop it but if you're on this side of the fence chance of graduating is 70 percent so you're probably going to be successful uh, so not perfect predictions, but it was pretty good. A lot better than just guessing. Uh, but we thought about what would be the business action? What are we going to do with that? Who are we going to tell that to? And we decided, I decided, it was dangerous. That was information people shouldn't have. You shouldn't have as a student. Um, could be very demoralizing uh, that, or give you false optimism. And from the perspective of faculty, they don't need that information. Uh, and so the tool we came up with, uh, I buried. Uh, it's It's been destroyed <laughs> because I thought the business action was going to be dangerous. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, and you got to think about the different players in this. And like I was just saying, who are the actors in this? And how are they going to use stuff? You need to think about these sorts of things. So this isn't just math. This is thinking about actual business situations, what you're doing with it. You got to think about what data is applicable, where you're going to get it. And with Target, there was stuff, but often we've got a huge amount of data, but we don't know which stuff we should be using. It, it may not be straightforward. And we'll be spending some time talking about that. We'll need a model. That's a formula stuff. That's the easy part of the job in some respect. Uh, and so that's what you did in Quant 1. You were working with models. We'll talk a little bit about those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes the models are very, very, very simple. You don't need complicated things for an awful lot of our decisions. And again, we got to look at success and those predictions and how implementation is going to be. What scares me about this story is it started in 2002, 20 years ago. What's Target doing now? And what are all those, what are many of those large firms doing now? in terms of data about us. It's it's almost terrifying uh, what they know. And they know a lot. And you've got to think about as a business student, what do you need to know to be able to function effectively? You, you aren't necessarily going to be an analyst. But still, what do you need to know to work with the analysts? So if you're an accountant, what should you be asking? What questions? You know, if the marketing people hadn't asked, can you tell us who's pregnant without them telling us. If they didn't know to ask the question, they would never have gone down that path. So maybe the important thing for you is, you know, maybe you're not a numbers person, but you're, you're gonna have to work with these numbers people. And do you know how to talk to them and ask good questions or know when they're not giving you information that is valuable or that thing? You need to be able to communicate. So you may not need to know a lot. Other people in other roles do need to know an awful lot. It varies as to what your role is. The course is just a foundation, an introduction. I'm not trying to develop experts. So what I'm going to do in the next class is introduce you to some of the most common data mining applications, like value estimation and classification and so on. But the most important part is talking about the process. And it's a sort of a six-step process. And the chapters, we're going to go uh, in chapter two into the sort of the first data portion of that process. And when we get to week 12, it'll be that deployment, implementation, that end of the process. So we're going to walk through beginning to end. And I'll keep coming back to the process aspect over and over again. I'm not that interested in you getting mastery of any specific tool. Because if you forget about it, you can always go online, Google it, and you'll get a video that'll show you how to do it. You know, if I want to find out how to cook some recipe, 
or some sort of food, I'll just Google it. And I'll, there's a there's bound to be a whole bunch of different videos out there that'll tell me how to do it and will give me instructions about ingredients and all of those types of things. That um, I, even if I forget, I can always go back and look it up. So tools aren't that important. We can always find out them. And there's always new tools coming along. So don't, that's not critical. But knowing how do I start and work through a problem? How do I begin and how do I end? That's, that's important. And that's what I'm hoping that you're going to get out of the course and is my main focus. I think I'm at the end of my slides. I've done a lot of talking. Uh, do you have questions for me at the moment before we sort of sign off? Anybody still there? Oh, Grace is still there, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Typing, are we getting things? So the next class, yeah, it's going to be Monday, and uh, that. So this class, Monday, Wednesday, eight thirty. Uh, this is your classroom. That uh, you don't have to come to class, so you can do this whole course asynchronously if you want. Um, that uh, the questions during the reviews, the quiz questions, the questions that are within the chapter are the quiz. So you'll see 10 questions in each chapter. That constitutes your quiz. And uh, you don't need to attend anything. Uh, so you can do it any way you like. That uh, I don't take attendance. So even the mm, participation portion, it's through the discussion board, and you can do that whenever you want. So um, that uh, I'll record every lecture. Sometimes I run into problems with my recording and uh, we lose it, but I do the class twice. So I'll record this one and I will, I am doing it now, and I'll post it. Um, I probably won't get it posted until the afternoon and the slides will get posted. They, uh, uh, but if for some reason the recording got corrupted in some fashion, then I'm going to record another class starting at 10 o'clock and I'll post you the 10 o'clock class. So you'll have it to go back and see that um, the, so you'll, you should always see something there. I'll keep you informed as we go. So you're quite capable of doing the course with never coming to see my class again. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'd prefer that you did, um, because then I get some stuff in chat and I feel like there's somebody out there. Um, but last term I did have some days when there were only four people. Uh, it was lonely. Um, the, uh, uh, the, with the videos, um, let me know. I, I used YouTube to post my videos too. Um, I can upload it to Top Hat as a video, but for you to play it, you then have to download it to your machine. And those recordings of a class of 75 minutes is a really big, big file. Um, so the lectures, you will see them uh, in your tree in Top Hat. So right now you see uh, in the tree, uh, just chapter one, and that's probably the last thing that's visible to you. You'll see below, you, I think the discussion uh, thing is visible to you. That uh, this afternoon you will see a recording uh, in that list, and you will also uh, see the PowerPoint slides in that. Um, that um, I've never used Snapchat. I, I say I'm, I, uh, uh, I, I'm not that familiar with an awful lot of technology, but you guys are already exchanging things um, that uh, if there is a forum I can set up to allow you to better uh, link together, then great. Uh, assignments are generally due midnight on Fridays. And at the moment, I'm looking at... Uh, 
what I found worked last term is the Wednesday before an assignment is due, I'm going to try to structure um, my lecture for that day to be relatively short so that we can walk through assignment questions. So as you're working through your assignments, if you run into problems, you can email me about that. But I'd prefer you email me to advise me about issues that you've got and you'd like me to walk through. And I can share my screen. I can walk through Excel and show you what I'm doing there uh, to assist you in doing it. And we did that last term with the last couple assignments. I basically did the assignments for them in class. But still, it really helped them learn the stuff. Uh, and it, they said it made a big difference in that regard. So that's in my plans for this term is Wednesday. Um, if it's a week with an assignment, uh, it's probably a class you'll want to attend because I'll give you a whole bunch of hints and advice and guidance on how to get that assignment done. Um, Okay, I've been watching chat and you've all been exchanging, I guess, your um, handle or whatever on Snapchat um, or some sort of uh, platform. Uh, are there any last questions for me before we sign off? Um, Snap IDs. Okay. <laughs> they, I, I hope you use them. Do whatever you can to interact with one another. Uh, loneliness was the biggest problem we had in the fall term. Um, it, the, we had a lot of, I think, serious depression situations. And in large measure, it was because people, they were alone. Um, and with some of them, I would have Zoom meetings with them just so they could talk. Uh, and I'll do that again this term if you need me. And you'd prefer not doing it by email, but by Zoom then we can schedule and do it that way. Okay, you guys take care. I'm gonna sign off and end the recording now and you will see me uh, next Monday. Take care. Glad that you showed up for today. Hello.